I am Greg Allison, Executive Vice President of the National Space Society, and I welcome you to this splendid start of this, I can't even talk this morning, stupendous space spectacular. I think I can start with too many yeses, I'm tripping on myself here. <laughs> um, we have a really splendid program this morning, and uh, we'll get to it in a minute, but first I want to make just a few, hopefully quick announcements. Uh, one is uh, a lot of you guys have something in your registration package that I want you to look at. As chairman of the, the, of the policy committee, which is one of the other positions, uh, we're going to do a space blitz in Washington, D.C. a month from now. And I'd like to have as many of you guys participating as possible because we need to put some manpower, some feet on the hill, basically. So uh, please take a look at that and register if you can. If for some reason you can't support it, find a friend that can because we need to move this thing forward. Um, I have another couple of announcements. Uh, one of them is that uh, Loretta, uh, George's 2B, I believe, uh, his, uh, Loretta Hill Doggo has uh, lost a laptop. And this laptop has uh, Yuri's Night uh, on it, so you know, it's one of her big programs. Probably the only laptop with a Yuri's Night sticker on it. So if anybody finds that, uh, you can take it to George. You see him all over the conference, or Loretta, either one, if you should see her. Uh, she needs her laptop back as soon as possible. And there's a lot of things on there that she needs. So your cooperation with that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, another announcement. Uh, we have a, you know, we're a group of volunteers uh, who've come together to promote space. And uh, it's interesting what some people will do to further the cause of space. And sometimes we have to give them some appreciation. Uh, could you put up Aaron Peterson's picture, please, over there? There's a lady. Aaron Peterson is a young woman who is participating in a NASA bed rest study in the Cleveland Clinic. This involves 90 days flat on her back, suspended by slings. Can, can, can you get a picture up? There we go. Now, look at that. Hey, by the way, Keith Callum was telling me about this, and he said, hey, when I worked at NASA, I complained if they moved my chair. So look at that, 90 days like that. Well, she's almost done with her 90-day tour of duty. Uh, she was featured live on CNN with an interview just this morning. And Aaron noted that she could have made as much, much more money in a real job. Uh, but some things are, are, you know, like space exploration are just worth it and can be a lot more important. Uh, Aaron truly embodies the spirit of exploration and she deserves your applause. So everybody for Aaron Peterson. <laughs> now I have a question. How many of you truly want to go to space? Raise your hand. Hey, all right, cool. Well, you come to the wrong panel. No, 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 not, not at all, actually. <laughs> Well, you're really going to love this morning's program. Uh, we have a great panel here of people who I think are going to get you there. We have Peter Diamandis, Eric Anderson, Greg Olson, and Chris Farinata. Farinata, excuse me. <laughs> and um, Space Adventures is an interesting company because they're getting you there. And for your ticket to ride, I introduce the president and CEO of Space Adventures, Mr. Eric Anderson. Eric? Good morning. So uh, we have about an hour, and I thought that I would talk for 10 or 15 minutes and show you some uh, slides about what Space Adventures is doing now and what Space Adventures will be doing. Uh, over the next five years. Then I'd like to ask uh, our most recent private space traveler, space explorer, Greg Olson, to come up and talk a little bit about his experience and what he thought of space flight. And then uh, Peter will come up and talk for a few minutes. And then the, the four of us, including Chris Farinetta, who's the vice president of Space Adventures Orbital Program, will be available to answer your questions. So uh, we'll try to keep the present, presenting part to the first half or less. And then the last half, we can just talk and um, maybe tell some jokes. So let's start. Uh, space Adventures 
As many of you know, uh, the company has been around for several years. We were actually founded at the very tail end of 1998, so next year will be the 10 year anniversary of Space Adventures. Uh, we've been most well known for enabling uh, the first and only space tourists so far, uh, the most recent of which is Greg Olson, of course, to my right. And um, we've really grown a business, amazingly, selling space flights and space experiences. And uh, I'm, I'm quite proud of it, personally, and with the wonderful people who've helped us do this, uh, through some very difficult times, economically, through war, and SARS, and economic downturn, and even the disaster of the Columbia, we still managed to grow our business and find more people who are interested in space experiences and space flights, and uh, keep the lights on and keep things moving. And I think that's much more a testament to the interest uh, in the market and the incredible passion that there is for private space travel uh, than it is any brilliant things that we did. But uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun and we are, we are going to continue to do this and, and make new firsts and do new things for many, many years to come. Uh, as I mentioned, these are the three, the only three tourists, uh, private space explorers, private space travelers, however you'd like to, uh, to name them, who have gone to space. Dennis Tito. Today, in fact, I believe was the day he returned from space five years ago to the, to the day. It was May 5th, 2001. Um, so, welcome back, Dennis. Uh, Mark, of course, the first African in space. And most recently, Greg Olson, uh, who, who uh, perhaps even had the best experience yet. We'll share some of that with you. We've also had a number of corporate clients, uh, companies like Oracle and Pepsi and U.S. Airways and Volkswagen and others, major fortune brands who have uh, wanted to make use of the space travel theme to grow their companies and further their brands. So we're not only a, a, a company that uh, makes individuals' dreams come true, but we also have helped many companies in the corporate world to uh, build brand awareness and, and uh, achieve their marketing plans. So what do we do right now? Uh, we have a, a, a large panorama of space experiences on Earth. Many of you know about the zero gravity flights, uh, which we do here in the United States with our very close partner, Zero Gravity Corporation, headed by Peter Diamandis, and in Russia uh, on the Aleutian 76 cosmonaut training jet, which you can see Greg floating in right here. Uh, so we do a lot of zero-g flights. We've done dozens of them. We've had hundreds of people experience weightlessness. It's, a, it's an incredible amount of fun. I strongly suggest you sign up uh, on one of our flights. Uh, we've got flights in the next few days here with, with zero-g that are happening. So this is, a, this is a real space experience you can do on Earth today. We also sell programs in the world's most advanced uh, and high-performance jets. Uh, vehicles that can take you to the very edge of space where the view is, is like that and you're literally above 99% of the, of the atmosphere at an altitude of 20 kilometers. So we've also had hundreds of people experience this. Uh, even Dennis Tito, as he's mentioned many times, came over and flew with us on a MiG-25 and when he came back and, and had that five or ten minute view of the edge of space, he said, you know, that's when I really decided that I'd always known I wanted to go to space, but that's when I really decided I wanted to do it as soon as possible. It just was so fantastic. Um, other high performance jets that, that allow people to experience high G's and other environments that are similar to space flight. Neutral buoyancy training and other types of space flight training. All the different components of space flight training. In fact, that uh, Dr. Olson has gone through and others will go through are available on a sort of an a la carte basis through space adventures. Um, in Russia and elsewhere. We're expanding in, in, in other places where we can do space flight training and centrifuge runs and all sorts of different things which many people have done and found is very exciting. Here's a picture of the centrifuge. This is the TSF-18 centrifuge which is the largest centrifuge in the world located at the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. And let's talk about space flight, another program that we have right now and in fact there's more and more interest in uh, orbital space flight. Um, Dennis, of course, Mark, 
and Greg the only participants thus far, although we have uh, young internet success from Japan, Daisuke Enomoto will be flying on September 15th this year, uh, followed by uh, next year, Microsoft billionaire, in fact, one of Paul Allen's colleagues, uh, a gentleman by the name of Charles Simoni, uh, who is an avid aviation and space enthusiast and has recently signed up to be the next orbital client, along with a few others whom we haven't announced yet. There are, there are a lot of people who are in the queue and will be experiencing the, uh, the space experience of a lifetime over the next few years. So what is it like? I'll walk you through a little bit of what orbital, the orbital program entails. There's, as many of you know, several months of training. Uh, you do things like operate and train in the Soyuz simulator. Uh, there's extensive classroom training. You need to understand how the International Space Station works, how the Soyuz TMA spacecraft works, all the different things that would enable you to be uh, prepared and understand the safety requirements and essentially how to live and work and do the things that you want to do on the, the world's only space station, uh, which is an incredibly uh, amazing piece of technology that has uh, cost the nations of the world close to $100 billion, the size of a football field, in fact, the third brightest object in the sky at night, the International Space Station. Uh, this is, these are some photos just prior to uh, Dr. Olson's launch Soyuz TMA-7, which was last uh, fall, and this is a view of the, uh, of the crew inspection of the Soyuz spacecraft several days prior to the launch. This is the crew uh, arriving at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, which is the, the spaceport of, uh, of usage by the Federal Space Agency and the Russian aerospace industry. In fact, the same one they've used since the very, very beginning of manned spaceflight. This is a a picture of the Soyuz rocket with the spacecraft on its side, uh, arguably the world's most reliable rocket. Uh, certainly, uh, for manned spaceflight, it has the best and uh, most credible record of safety and reliability. Uh, it's a very evolved design. Uh, it's very similar in its in its overall aspects to the very first rocket, Vostok One, that carried Yuri Gagarin to space. And over, over the years, they haven't uh, revolutionarily changed its design. They've evolved it into a very mature system that has uh, multiple redundancies for safety and escape systems and has been through a lot of different anomalies. After each one, uh, they fixed it and moved on and into, the, uh, into the final sorts of operational phase that makes it a mature launch system. And very, very economical, comparatively. <laughs> I know I have voices in my head, but I didn't know they come through the microphone. So here's the Soyuz being uh, on the rails that take it out to the launch pad. It's only a matter of a couple of days, uh, the time from when it departs the assembly facility, and it literally is taken out to the launch pad. Here's the crew, uh, Greg with his crew, Bill MacArthur and Valery Tokarev. Uh, just a few days before the flight. This is the, uh, the vertical uh, lifting of the rocket on the launch pad. By the way, this is the very same launch pad where Yuri Gagarin launched from uh, 45 years ago. These are the crew members just hours before the flight. This is at the final press conference, a very exciting time. Uh, the, the backs of the heads that you see are the NASA administrator, the director of the Russian Space Agency, the general designer of RSC Energia, along with many other uh, officials and dignitaries, uh, the families of the crew, uh, we were lucky to be there as well. This is the final press conference where the well-wishing goes on and the, uh, the final we're ready and check out is done and then it's off to the rocket. Uh, you can see the smiles on their faces, Greg will tell you, uh, probably uh, this is the most exciting part prior to the launch. This is the launch. This is the launch pad from the side that you don't want to be watching from. <laughs> the, flame, the flame trench is uh, right there. This is a close-up view of the vehicle just probably two or three minutes prior to the launch. Uh, 
about 30 or 40 seconds prior to the launch, that large arm that you see on the right will retract. And then you know that we're just seconds away from launch. Uh, when the actual ignition occurs, the vehicle, the Soyuz vehicle's engines are lit. And these, these clamps that you see on the bottom actually hold the vehicle on the pad uh, for a couple of seconds just to make sure that the engines are working properly and the thrust level is obtained. And so you hear a low roar as you're watching the launch for several seconds. And then uh, you see these four clamps open up like a clamshell. And a couple of seconds later when the sound hits you, you can see that they really turn up the volume. And uh, not, long after, not long after that, the rocket is blasting skyward. It's an incredible thing to watch. I've seen many launches, many shuttle launches, and many Soyuz launches, and every time you watch one, it's still a, it's just an incredible experience. So uh, we do take people to watch these launches, and as if you ever would like to, to do something truly unique, you really should come along and watch a launch with us. Uh, once they reach orbit, uh, the Soyuz spends about a day, day and a half, orienting itself and catching up to the space station. Uh, this is the International Space Station, of course. Just quickly go through some of these. The Soyuz becomes uh, is docked to the space station. That process takes a couple of hours. We're lucky to be able to watch that many times from the Mission Control Center in Korolev in Russia, outside Moscow. This was the first picture that uh, Greg emailed me from space. One of the cool things about, uh, about the space station is, yes, there is email. And uh, in fact, there's also phone. Uh, through NASA, uh, there is an internet phone and, and usage of email. And so I got this email to me just a day or so after he arrived at the space station, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. We're, we're at the point now where we can do that. And uh, a couple of days later, Greg called me from space, which I thought was even cooler. And uh, so it's really, it's, really, it's really neat. He can tell you more about what it was like up there. Uh, this is Sergei Krikalev perhaps the most experienced and one of, certainly one of the greatest cosmonauts of all time, has flown in space many, many times and was Greg's crew commander on his way back from the space station. Uh, some views from space. It's really beautiful up there. Uh, as I hear, I, I can't wait to see the view myself. These are the Himalayas, the Aurora Borealis, Mount Etna in Italy, um, the United Arab Emirates, where we're, as I will tell you, we're building a spaceport for space tourism and even the New York metropolitan area where uh, Greg lives. So, uh, that's the Orbital Space Flight Program today. Um, it's going to continue every year, every client. We improve the program, we offer more options for uh, projects and uh, ways to share the experience and I just think it's a fantastic way to build the market and provide people with the, the ability to fulfill their dreams. So, programs under development. Let's talk a little bit about suborbital flight. As many of you know, we recently announced a, uh, a joint venture, uh, a project with Prodia, which is the venture capital firm owned by the Ansari family, the same Ansari family of Ansari X Prize notoriety. Uh, they have partnered with us to fully develop the Russian built uh, suborbital space vehicle called Explorer. Uh, Explorer will be carried atop an existing high altitude aircraft called the M55, uh, flown thousands of hours, it's done high altitude research over the Antarctic and the Arctic and can actually carry several tons of payload, which in this case is a suborbital space vehicle, to an altitude of uh, 17 or 18 kilometers, which enables us to use it as a first stage to launch this vehicle to space. Uh, we're very, very excited about this project. This is an earlier a photo of a mock-up of a, an earlier vehicle that was called C-21. The Explorer is not the C-21. It's, it's a different design. It's bigger. It has more seats. Uh, but it is built by the same design bureau. The design bureau that is leading the project uh, is the federal, excuse me, is the Masishev Design Bureau. Masishev has done uh, a great number of aero, aeronautic and space-related projects over the years. The most notable was the Russian space shuttle Buran. Uh, the Explorer design takes many components from the Buran, um, not only the aerodynamics, but the flight control systems and uh, many other components that, are, that were very advanced and frankly very useful for this type of application and, and ensuring safety and low cost and reusability. So the experience base uh, 
that we have to work with. By the way, I should also mention that the project, the suborbital project, is being managed uh, under the supervision of the Russian Federal Space Agency. So this is the agency, the umbrella organization, that essentially manages all the design bureaus under the, under the Russian space industry. So it, it's not only a project of Misishev as the lead designer, but there will be many others involved. And frankly, we'll be able to use and participate and benefit from the great experience of the entire Russian space industry, which in my opinion is probably uh, the most experienced in manned space flight and certainly uh, commercial human space flight so far, having, having been willing to undertake projects like uh, space flight participants and space tourism on the space station. So we're very proud to be working with them. Uh, we, don't, we haven't talked too much about the details of the project and we won't. Uh, we'll release information as it, as it becomes the right time to do so. Uh, rest assured that uh, the people working on it and our financing partners and the overall uh, management are, are taking it, are very much looking forward to it, taking it very seriously and looking forward to providing a service that many of you may be able to, to use to fly in space one day. Anyway, um, this is just a schematic of how the system works. Many of you probably already know this. We've picked two locations so far that these vehicles will be operating. Uh, they'll be operated by the local operating entity at those locations. One of them is in the Emirates. Uh, for any of you who have been to Dubai, you know that it is an unbelievable tourist destination. Uh, it's a place that is focusing on the future uh, and very, very friendly to the world and to the West and, and a place that is ideal for a space tourism operation. So we've partnered with the government of one of the Emirates. Uh, the, the, the UAE is very much in support of this project and we'll be working there to launch a, a suborbital facility here very soon. Also Singapore. Uh, Singapore has a great history of being a port. Uh, they're one of the largest seaports in the world, one of the largest airports as a city state. Uh, investing in transportation and the future and technology is something that's critical for them and in fact the Singapore consortium that has been put together has also committed to building a spaceport and having a suborbital operating facility in Singapore. Uh, unlike the UAE project, the Singapore project in the interest of full disclosure has not been fully financed yet although there are uh, some significant investors who come in at the beginning. Uh, but we anticipate that it will be soon and it will probably be the second location where we'll be operating these vehicles. Uh, and now perhaps to the most exciting project, which is our uh, first private voyage around the moon. Uh, last August we announced this, this incredible project in cooperation with the Federal Space Agency and RSC Energia, the company that builds the Soyuz. Uh, for some number of years uh, we've been looking at it in cooperation with them and they, they had come back with a, a very detailed feasibility analysis of the idea of using a Soyuz spacecraft, which again, is the, the most used and flown manned space vehicle ever, uh, to actually do a circumlunar free return flight around the moon. Of course, you'd need more energy to do that, and so it would require the launching of a separate upper stage, which would then rendezvous with the vehicle and provide it with enough delta V to go around the moon. But all of that turned out to be quite feasible. There is a historical precedent for Russians sending uh, spacecraft that could carry people around the moon in the, in the context of the late 60s and early 70s with a program called Zond. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to this. We announced it. We have uh, a number of interested people. And uh, we think that by the end of the decade, we'll be able to literally fly the first private voyage around the moon. It would probably start with a several day stay on the space station. By the way, this is a, by way of perspective, this is a photograph of the altitude 100 kilometers from the surface of the moon. Uh, you know, our suborbital program will be taking you 100 kilometers above the Earth, but for the low, low price of only $100 million, you can fly within 100 kilometers of the far side of the moon. Frankly, the most, just the most exciting thing ever. Um, we're very excited about that and it's only a beginning and uh, the ability of private citizens to be able to do things like this just is inspiring. Uh, again, here's the, the, the photo that shows, the, the, the rendering that shows the first a several days stay at the space station as one option, followed by an undocking and then a rendezvous with the upper stage which would then take you around your six day journey around the moon. So that's the lunar program, the other program we're developing. Uh, it's got a lot of press. 
the infamous Drudge Report, put it there. We had New York Times and all, all sorts of other press following us. And um, it frankly has, uh, has been something which, which we've been very proud of and had a lot of interest in even more than we might have thought originally. Uh, I guess in summary, what we're about is providing space experiences and really using and uh, opening up the market for commercial space flight, space tourism, to create a new space age. You know, it's been 45 years, literally just a couple weeks ago, it was the 45th anniversary of space flight. And uh, over the next 45 years, there's going to be so much change and so much progress and so much advancement that it's going to it's going to blow our minds. The future is so bright, it burns my eyes. <laughs> so, with that, I'd like to invite Greg to come up and talk for a few minutes about, uh, about your experience and anything else you'd like to say, and then afterwards, Peter. Thanks very much. I don't have any prepared slides or remarks, so I'll be brief. I, I much prefer to get into a question and answer mode. But uh, I did want to take this opportunity to tell you that, you know, I came back from space about seven months ago now, and it was really one of the best experiences of my life. I would say the best after the birth of my daughters. That's a remark Dennis Tito and I share. Uh, it really was a fabulous experience. And you know, it's not just the 10 days in space, which is wonderful. It, it was the whole journey, you know, of training, you know, living in a new culture. You spent six months in Star City, um, Moscow. Uh, and afterwards, you become part of a family that's really a lifetime experience. Uh, during my six months of training, I met dozens and dozens of astronauts and cosmonauts. And I'll tell you one thing, these are really decent people. In addition to being the best of both countries, uh, they're really nice and super helpful. Uh, when I spent a week in Houston, and Bill MacArthur and his wife Cindy looked after my daughter and grandson. Um, you know, now I live in Princeton. Ed Liu comes by and spends a month in Princeton, looks me up, and you know, you become part of this extended family. And uh, you know, this was all arranged by Space Adventures, and uh, I think I'm part of their extended family now. So uh, you know, I just want to summarize. This is a great, great experience, and uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. And, how grateful I am to you know, the whole Space Adventures team for uh, getting me through the experience and you know, continually keeping me in the family. Uh, last month, I went back for the launch and landing uh, of the next crew. And Space Adventures got me to the actual landing site uh, in uh, Kazakhstan. I was actually there when they pulled Bill MacArthur out of the capsule. And uh, the thing I did when he walked away is I had a bag of Starbucks coffee and I gave him a whiff. <laughs> so, because uh, we, we had talked about that on the station as to, you know, what we want to do as soon as we come down. And, you know, having coffee was high on his list. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, it, it really, you know, it, it's definitely a life-changing experience. Uh, I know I go around to a lot of schools now trying to get more American kids uh, to consider science and engineering as a career. And I'll tell you, when you wave that space flag up there, it really gets their attention. So, bottom line, I had a great experience, and I thank these guys at Space Adventures for doing it, and I'll welcome the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate your inviting me to join the panel here. Uh, there is an incredible amount of exciting things going on, and I think we're just going to start to see. This is circa the early 90s of the internet when you know Netscape came on, and you started seeing applications going happening. And whoever thought that uh, you know 100 million dollars worth of business could be generated flying to the ISS? Surely, five years ago, that concept of regular flights, let alone going to the moon and and so forth. So we're going to start to see a lot of inventive business ideas uh, materializing over the, over the years ahead. I'd like to share uh, three of the businesses that I, I currently uh, am uh, running that are all intended to try and take us off a dependence of government dollars for the commercial space arena. Uh, because frankly, you know, just turning around and offering a service back to the government is not commercial space. Um, there are three that I'm, I'm very passionate about. 
Uh, the first is the XPRIZE Cup. I want to uh, take a moment and tell you about what's going on this year. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, we uh, last year for the first time had our, our what we call countdown in the XPRIZE Cup, was sort of our, our demo. Out of curiosity, how many folks were physically there, if you could raise your hand? Okay, about, about a dozen. I want to, my goal is to entice all of you to make the venture this year. We had about 12,000 people in this one-day event. If you weren't there, we had anomalous winds, which were uh, kind of um, made it a challenge to get rocket flights when you've got you know 30 mile an hour gusts uh, and at the end of the day up to 60 miles an hour. But we went back to look at the record for the last 20 years, and that was really out of the norm. Uh, we ran a competition uh, nationwide and had numerous bidders. New Mexico, Governor Richardson, did their bid over $10 million to capture this annual event. The vision there, the goal of what I want to, I want to build is called the America's Cup of Space, the uh, Indianapolis 500, the um, Oshkosh of Space, the place that you go every year to actually physically watch the rockets fly, touch the hardware, go and meet the pilots, maybe negotiate your flight on a vehicle. Uh, we, New Mexico has a very interesting history in that it was actually the very first place in the U.S. that we ever launched a rocket into space. The captured V2 program from Punta Mundo was brought back to New Mexico, and in the, uh, in the late 40s, we flew a refurbished V2 into uh, beyond the 50-mile mark out of White Sands over there. Uh, if you've got a, uh, a piece of paper or your, uh, your Palm Pilot, write down these dates, October 18th through the 21st in Las Cruces, New Mexico, about an hour away from El Paso. Uh, we're going to be having the XPRIZE Cup this year. There's two parts. There's a, the first part is a uh, the personal spaceflight CEOs conference. It's a very high-end conference like the TED conference, the Davos conference. Um, we're going to have, it's uh, limited to 300 people in attendance. Uh, that will be going on Wednesday night and Thursday. Um, and again, it's, it's open to you. You'll be, we'll start publicizing about a month on the uh, XPRIZE.org website. But the real fun part is starts on Friday, the uh, 20th, and Saturday, the 21st. It'll be two days this year uh, for the XPRIZE Expo. And we're going to have something like 25 to 30 rocket flights over the course of two days. And that's, that's the vision, that's the goal. Uh, we're going to be unveiling the new X-Racer. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, here was the, uh, the prototype vehicle from uh, X-Core, the easy rocket flying last year. Uh, in addition, at the end of this next session with Shannon Dale, we'll be announcing the details of the Lunar Lander Challenge, but we're going to have about three and a half million dollars in cash purses up for grabs at this year's XPRIZE Cup. Way ahead of schedule. I'm very proud of uh, what we've been able to materialize there. But we're going to have the Lunar Lander Challenge. I'll go into those details, reasonable rocket challenge, and uh, a few others driving, again, literally a rocket flight every like 15 minutes. It's going to be a very intense, we're going to be doing a global webcast. Um, and driving that forward. On the ground, we also uh, want to highlight, we'll have uh, folks hopefully from Virgin and Rocket Plane and Armadillo and Space Adventures and all others to, to bring their vehicles and actually physically see it go in, in where you can uh, touch and feel the hardware, talk to the designers, see physically what is materializing. That's the goal, to make it a personal experience for each and every one of you worth the trek down to uh, Las Cruces. Um, and then making it uh, a participatory event. Uh, one of my goals is that for every rocket launch, actually getting, choosing a kid from the audience to go and push the big red button and change their life. I'm serious, that's, that's, the, that's the, the mission and the touch and feel we want to accomplish with the XPRIZE Cup. So please come on down and participate. Um, you know, the, the vision, we had demonstration flights last year, we start with the cash prizes, we're going to start amateur X-Prize activities going on, uh, the rocket racing finals every year will take place at the X-Prize Cup, and then the long-term goal is where we actually have races to space, where people are flying up to 100 kilometers, number of flights in a day, the, uh, you know, cross distances, really put cash prizes down and bring the media to the table. Uh, when we were in negotiations on the X Prize uh, with HBO and Showtime and ABC and NBC about doing reality TV and so forth, what we learned was they were not able to monetize the event because we couldn't tell them whether the flight was going to occur in Mojave or Kazakhstan, let alone what year the X Prize was going to be won in. So by not knowing when and where it was going to happen, the value of the television wasn't there. 
The reason that uh, NBC spends $400 million on, uh, on the Olympics is that they can sell Mattel Saturday morning advertising rights because women's gymnastics is going on, they want to sell Barbie doll ads. So by knowing exactly when and where the XPRIZE Cup will happen every year, we can bring the media players, that brings the sponsors, that brings the money, that brings the teams, and it's a positive cycle. It creates a business environment. And I know, uh, you know, Bert yesterday said, oh, we're just making money. Well, guys, the fact of the matter is, God bless us, if we can make money in commercial space, that will get all of us there, because we have to get off the government dole and actually create profitable exothermic, you know, capital reactions. <laughs> Uh, very quickly, uh, Zero G, if those of you at dinner last night uh, saw my, my partner, Noah McMahon. Um, we have two 727s operating right now. Uh, very proud, we just announced permanent operations out of the Kennedy Space Center. They've given us permission to do 280 flights a year out of KSC off of the SLF, and uh, we're really excited about that. Uh, we're adding a third airplane, uh, which will be based out of Las Vegas. Uh, opening up West Coast flights. We actually did a flight uh, yesterday in LA. We have a flight scheduled today in Las Vegas. Uh, Google has bought four flights. We're up in San Jose uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Really thrilled about the progress there. And as Eric mentioned, we have a very close working relationship with Space Adventures. We've done 65 flights, um, over you know, 2,000 customers. We have flown research flights. Very proud to have flown flights uh, for, the, uh, for the agency but one where commercial is our main business and then bringing benefits of lower cost flights to the government is an added benefit. Um, media flights uh, from the Matrix to, uh, to uh, in partnership with uh, Space Adventures, Martha Stewart, uh, and a bunch of corporate incentive flights. This is the inside of G-Force One, our airplane, 30 seats in the back of the airplane, about 70 linear feet up front. We go from a cargo configuration on the left-hand side to a open interior zero-g configuration. One of the things that we do on the research front, and some of you here uh, who are in the movie business or doing research, we can ship uh, basically flat pallets to you. These are the pallets we have on, in slide one. You mount your experiments on the pallets. They're ready. We land the airplane. We then, in, within an hour, load all the pallets on board. They're ready to go and you go and fly. And so it's a very turnkey operation. The pallets go out to you a week in advance, the airplane lands, we fly, the airplane goes to the next location. A very efficient use of an asset. And uh, as I mentioned, down in KSC, uh, Las Vegas, and uh, possibly in Houston as well. Uh, education is very important to us. Uh, we flew our first two teacher flights in November of last year. Our goal is to get up to flying 1,000 teachers a year. Uh, we're going to be announcing some very exciting programs in the uh, months ahead along those lines. And so, again, a touch and feel, inspiring people to actually go. This is, this is real weightlessness. Okay? The physicists and physicist the audience can explain it. It's not simulated in any fashion. It's very real. Um, take one second to show a few minutes of, uh, of this uh, flight we did with Space Adventures. Experience, and it was really the highlight of the vacation, something that I will be talking about for a long time. Thanks to a company called Zero Gravity Corporation, I experienced exactly what astronauts feel when they reach zero gravity. Uh, the company offers civilians a chance to experience true weightlessness, and it's not simulated in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I, a friend of mine uh, took us uh, sort of like a Christmas present. Uh, Fifteen of us uh, to Fort Lauderdale, and here we are in this 727 airplane where, I mean, uh, that's a, a Martian uh, gravity, where you're one-third uh, one of your weight. Then we experience lunar gravity, where you're one-third of your weight. <laughs> and you can do one finger push-ups. Now watch this. Now we're going to become, this is zero gravity, where, where you're just trying to figure out what is going on. And then you can fly. It's actually lunar. You can uh, actually do that. Uh, 
Uh, it was a lot of, lot of fun. And hopefully, hopefully something all of you, our goal is 10,000 people a year in Zero G. Uh, very quickly, uh, you might have heard about the Rocket Racing League. Uh, very serious, very real business. This is a multi-billion dollar opportunity. Uh, these are, you know, just like uh, Formula One and NASCAR. We're going to be flying these rocket-powered airplanes in a one-mile by two-mile by half-mile track. We have these virtual tunnels, same technology on Monday Night Football that shows you the first down line. We'll superimpose this. Let's take a look at uh, some little video clip here. Audio. So we actually were flying about 10 X racers, uh, staggered takeoffs, they do touch and goes on the passes. They'll have about four minutes of fuel on board, locks, liquid oxygen, and kerosene. Uh, and after they do about four minutes of boosted, they can turn it on and off when they want. There's about four minutes of boost, eight minutes of glide between a lap, they come back and they refuel. x our prime contractor, actually uh, in this pit stop demonstrated 250 pounds of cryogenic locks in 50 seconds, refueling it. So uh, that will be fun. A few other short clips. Working very closely with our partners uh, in, uh, at the FA with Patty Smith and her team to uh, to get this all safe and regulated. After several passes around the course, racers will get for a lack of refueling of liquid oxygen and kerosene. Every seven seconds or so, crowds will see an X racer breathing fire as our heroic pilots fly around the track. Uh, the vehicle, uh, the Easy Rocket, actually was a demonstration vehicle for this. It used liquid oxygen and uh, alcohol, providing a very clear flame, which is not what we want. We want a brilliant, you know, <laughs> humongous flame. So we went to uh, LOX and kerosene, uh, and you'll see in a moment. They also had two 400-pound engines. The new vehicle actually have one 1,500-pound engine, so twice the thrust, twice the fuel on board. We're using a Velocity aircraft body. The first of these airplanes is actually under construction right now at Mojave um, and will be debuted at the X-Prize Cup this October. Uh, that photo in the bottom is actually the engine at high noon. It's so bright the F-stop couldn't capture it. And uh, we have some great pilots. Uh, Rick Searfoss, uh, one of our two chief pilots, and Sean Tucker, who is the, uh, the top aerobatic rated pilot in, in the world who flies for Larry Ellison at Oracle, and of course, Eric Lindbergh. So with that, Eric, to you for questions. We, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so we'll take some questions here for the last few minutes. Here in the yellow. Gregory, uh, after your flight on Soyuz, it looks pretty cramped on there. What do you think about a circumlunar? Would, uh, that would probably be, what, four days for a circumlunar? Six. Six days. It's only, it's only cramped while you're waiting to launch. You can think about two and a half hours, and also the 10 minutes while you're going to orbit. You should have a pretty high G force. Once you're in orbit, you remember your waves. So uh, it's a lot different. And once you leave check the system and everything checks out, you can loosen your belts and get out of the seat, float around a little bit. So it's uh, it's not as bad as it seems. Question there. Um, I noticed in the pictures, uh, so everything was really bright, clean, spiffy. I think that it's something easy to come with. It's a great experience, but bright, clean, and spiffy was not. I was wondering if something changed, or do you think of the photos? <laughs> well, let me comment on that. You, you know, your observations might have some validity, but I'll tell you this, the Russian systems work. Space is a little bit different than, you know, old bus stops and apartment buildings. The space, the, the space industry in Russia, and I'll let Chris add to this as well, is the leading commercial 
you know, it's the leading, it's the leading commercial activity in space in the world. And, uh, you know, the country is a lot richer than it was 15 years ago. You know, so. Yeah, the uh, past two years, they put a lot into, uh, especially down at the cotton mill, they fixed it up and uh, painted everything up and uh, made it to most of them. One of the engineers, though, got a bike more confident that two more winners and it'll all go back to the way that it normally was in the morning. Rusting, rough humor, because the environment down there is so, so alkaline and so caustic and just in the, uh, the weather conditions. So, they, they, they really put, the, they put their, their effort into the technology that matters. They're not too big on that. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to make clear that Space Adventures is a U.S. company, and Space Adventures is neither, uh, will not be an operator or developer of, of these vehicles. So we're a travel company. We sell tickets. Um, we do have, uh, or will potentially have an equity stake in some of those potential operators and developers, but uh, it, it's not in the purview of what Space Adventures does to uh, to exercise a lot of control or effect on that. Um, you know, clearly, uh, the governments of the Emirates and Singapore will look to the leaders, the world leaders in spaceflight, which right now are the Russian Federation and the United States, and uh, will sort of take the regulatory lead, I would guess, of those entities. So, you know, the Russians have launched several Russian rockets from outside of Russia, for example, uh, and as has the United States. So, I don't think they're going to be inventing the wheel. Uh, question here. Uh, do you intend to have uh, future rocket racing leagues uh, decide what propellant they want to use? Uh, good question. The, uh, in the beginning, uh, we're going to be uh, licensing basically 10 teams. Uh, we're also doing a competition about where the state, where the actual races, the regional races, will be. Uh, in 2007, the goal is to have uh, four regional races. The semifinals every year will be at Marino Air Races. We had that agreement with them in the finals of the X-Price Cup. And then we'll grow into uh, 10 races in 2008 and then go to the national after that. But in the beginning, the vehicles will all be identical. Uh, and just like uh, we're following the footsteps of Formula One and, and India and so forth, eventually, as we start to learn the dynamics and get the safety of the race in place, we'll allow some variability within constraints so that they can, teams can start to uh, uh, adjust their vehicles eventually. Question. Uh, yes, uh, the buffeting and uh, you know acceleration forces actually on launch was fairly smooth. We got to about three and a half G's going up. Uh, but other than that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of shake, rattle, and rolling uh, on the launch. Uh, I, I would say all in all, it's pretty smooth. Uh, the astronauts tell me, you know, the shuttle has a lot more vibration going up, just from uh, the symmetry of the vehicle. Uh, coming down, it was a bit more, uh, let's say, anxiety-provoking. You know, we, we not only hit four, over four and a half G's coming down, deceleration. Uh, but of course there, there's a lot of vibration and shaking, especially when the parachute is deployed. You know, there's a sudden thrust upward, uh, and you're buffering it around quite a bit. But keep in mind, you simulate a lot of this uh, during your training. You, know, you do centrifuge runs that uh, pretty much uh, go over what you're going to feel. And also, you know almost to the second what's going to happen. You know, you've got a book there with a the timeline, so uh, even though it is kind of hairy, um, you know, I, none of us were too frightened while it was going on. Question there. Question was, are there any plans for landing on the moon commercially? Um, the answer is, uh, 
the vision of Space Adventures goes far beyond the programs that we're doing right now. Um, I think the, uh, the very edge of what we can talk about and sell and provide commercially right now is the Circle Lunar Flight. Um, but once we execute the first Circle super, super Lunar Flight, uh, then there'll be the next one and the next one, and there are logical steps which take us on even more ambitious programs. But, uh, we wouldn't, want to, we wouldn't want to hurt our credibility by talking about things too far in advance. I'd like to uh, add to that also and say that there's plenty of room for the Soyuz for uh, two other government passengers as well. So we can do a, do a hybrid mission that's both private and government. And, uh, it's actually a better way to, to go when you've got two different customers on board, just keeping each other honest. Uh, question here. Uh, I, I, uh, I had a great time. I loved it. Sure, I'd love to go again. I mean, if, they, if somebody takes me out right now, I'd go. I'd launch. Uh, you know, this moon thing really excites me. But I, I guess I'll have to go out and sell another company before I do that. <laughs> I would love to do it, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm seriously thinking about it. Over there. Well, I, I the question was about the, the, the language, having to learn the language to turn for a like Russian. That was definitely, trying to learn Russian was definitely the hardest part of my training. I mean, I'll, I'll readily admit that. Um, you know, we have translators during our classes. I mean, all the uh, classes are given in Russian language by Russian instructors. Uh, we have very good translators there. And uh, of course, we have classes in Russian. So I did learn a certain amount. Obviously, you've got to learn the technical terms. Uh, I would not say I'm fluent in Russian. Just having when you're 60 years old, even six months isn't enough, at least for me, to pick up a language. But uh, I really got to love the Russian people and the, the Russian country. You know, they're, they're really solid people. Uh, once you get to know them, you know, they'll help you. Uh, I saw no uh, jealousy, competition, or anything like that between uh, cosmonauts and astronauts, or even uh, you know, at the higher levels. I just saw a total cooperation. Everyone realizes, you know, space is inherently, uh, you know, a risky business. So you've got to be 100% devoted towards the mission and not about all the personal stuff. And I'll tell you, my seven months of training plus the ten days in space, I, I saw no animosity whatsoever. And I was very well treated by both the Russian space agency and NASA. We have time for one more question from the back this time. You who stood up. Uh, this question is for Peter. It has to do with the uh, Rocket Racing League. Uh, is he going to have a flying vehicle with the X-Prize Cup, or is it going to be a static display? Question one. And question two, uh, if you... Question two. If you went today to get the FAA to approve NASCAR, or they kill a fan once in a while by having a car end up in the, the stands, I don't think you can get it done. How are you handling the safety part of the uh, rocket racing league? Great, uh, great question. Uh, first of all, on the first question, we, we, our intent is to have a flying vehicle, uh, the excellent racer flying. Uh, we will probably have it flying along with a propeller-driven version to show the difference between the two. Uh, we'll be doing a number of shows on Friday and Saturday for those of you who are out there or those on the webcast. Uh, the issue of safety is, is critical. No question about it. And it's really a balancing act. Okay? It's a balancing act between uh, doing everything that is reasonable to make it safe and these virtual tunnels that uh, will, depth, will actually lay out this, uh, this racetrack in the sky. Okay? By the way, you'll see it on the Jumbotron, on the TV, on the internet, and the pedals here on the head of display. Those, uh, those uh, uh, tunnels will actually give you uh, separation between the vehicles. So, while they'll be racing against each other, there will be sufficient separation. But, you know, even the real air races, there are deaths. And we just, in the space business, and I talk about this all the time on the risk factor, we've got 
to allow for a certain amount of risk, you know, because otherwise without that risk, it can have no breakthroughs. And uh, for me, rocket racing will drive engine technology. We start to produce thousands of rocket restarts per year that will help all of us eventually get into space. So. Okay, if you have any other questions, you can come talk to us up here, but uh, our time is up. Thanks very much.